everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is Watch Art Side. Uh, today we're taking on a topic that, to be honest with you, I've been somewhat avoiding <laughs> because it's so controversial. And this has to do with ranking watches and watch brands. Now, before I, I start, uh, let me say this. Uh, first of all, why do it? And the reason is that it, it helps us gauge what we're getting as collectors. Uh, th there's no reason to do it in terms of sort of one-upping somebody else. That's, that's not the point. But rather that if you pay a lot of money for a watch, uh, you're, you want to get the best watch you can. And what a ranking will do, it will give you some sense of the value of the watch in terms of the horological value. So uh, let's get started. And these, the, the ones that I have are, they're fairly, they, they come from a, a standard that was set up. And they come from actually a lot of different places. And I jiggled the standard because the standard was seemed to be getting a little long in the truth. Uh, if you want to check it out yourself, there's a, a site called uh, watch-rankings.com. And they describe themselves as the definitive ranking site. And when anything calls itself the definitive, you know, like... If it's definitive, it's definitive. If it's not, it's not. You don't have to call yourself that. So, uh, but anyway, it was some place to start that somebody went to the trouble of looking at all of the different watch brands and came up with something. Uh, some of the things I didn't agree with and I had good reasons for it. And so some of the watches were moved up or down in the, in the chart. Okay. So uh, I also, too, came up with, uh, I tried to, Oh, I don't know if shrink is the right word, but consolidate the the categories of horology into four. Okay, uh, the very best ones at the top are called exceptional horology. This is uh, the kind of the very best watches uh, that are out there. The ones that are winning all the top prizes, the ones that are unfortunately the most expensive and most sought after. And the second category is high horology, and a high horology is where you have a great deal of attention given to the watch, but the the production is high enough so that it, it's not at the very top. And and by that I mean it's not you know you don't have somebody who is a highly trained specialist spending a lot of time on it, or at least as much time as you would have in the uh, area of exceptional horology. The, uh, uh, the holy trinity of Patek, Philippe, Vacheron, Constantin, and Audemars Piguet are part of this high horology. Uh, the next level is strong horology, and this is, this was, this is always a tough one, because you have some the, the the base criteria is for the strong horology. They make their own movements. Uh, to call themselves a watch company and not making their movements uh, to some is is outrageous. <laughs> you know, yeah, I don't think it's outrageous. I just if you're going to call yourself a watch company and you're making watches and you don't make movements, you I'm not sure what it would be, but. The, the majority of the watches from Strong Horology are made by the, the company that has them. Now, you can have, there's certain caveats to this or certain exceptions. And your exceptions lie in where you have a really excellent horological movement that was sort of jointly done with a company that specializes in that. And you can find that in all levels of, um, of horology. And uh, usually you find it in exceptional horology and high horology. It's strong horology may have some of that. But for the most part, 
thus strong horology is, is, is pretty much these companies that make their own movements. And finally is what I call standard horology. And standard horology, you've got a lot of different types of watches, but basically these are watch companies that prefer not to make the movement, but they're going to use somebody else's movement. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, but it's like if, if you buy a watch, if you pay for it, you know, and somebody has put in a hundred dollar movement and they want five thousand dollars for the watch, I would have real questions about that. So that's this is the kind of attitude. Now, this is totally from the collector's point of view. Uh, there are some very good reasons that on the business end that you may see things a little differently. In fact, you might see them a lot differently. So uh, talking about all of these things, we're talking about it on the collector's uh, point of view. All right, let's take a look at these uh, four different categories. We'll start with uh, standard horology. And the, the example watch I have there is one that you may not have heard of. It's called uh, Jean Ricard or Jean Richard. This watch company, for the most part, uses ETA movements. I think it may be some Salida movements. Uh, but they also make their own. They have one that they make, and it's a it's a fairly simple one. Uh, and you say, well, wait a minute. Now, didn't you say that watches like this belong in strong horology? Yes, I did. If they if they make their own movements, but there there are different ways of making your movements. Now, Jean Richard or Jean Ricard is one of those watch companies that's in transition, in my opinion. And by in transition, when a watch company starts making their own movements, they're looking to move out of one category into another. Usually it's from a standard up into a strong horology. And I think that uh, not only Jean Ricard, but other ones as well we're going to run into. Okay, so... Uh, uh, Moulet uh, Glasshut is another one in this. So when we see these, is that uh, you take a company like here's another one is uh, Bon and Mercier. Uh, someone told me, oh well, that company is is great because they're really old. <laughs> yeah, but they, they may be really old. They may have started hundreds of years ago. But the ownership and the management and everything else, and they at some point in time, uh, they began using fairly inexpensive movements. Now, very recently, they just came out with one of their own. They're, they're sort of their first new in-house movement. Uh, so that may change things. So the same thing is true with um, Maurice Lacroix. In fact, Maurice Lacroix has got a lot of of in-house movements now, and they probably, we well, start thinking of those in terms of moving up. Uh, Longines, uh, this is another company. Now, they just won an award for the Grand, uh, won a Grand Prix award. Now, when that happens, when you start winning Grand Prix awards uh, for your watches, that's that becomes a little more special, and it depends on the award they win and so forth. Uh, Longines won it for, um, I think they I think they call it the Heritage Award, and this is taking something from their past and sort of bringing it back again. Okay, uh, Raymond Weil. Now Raymond Weil is one uh, I I have a Raymond Weil, and, and their their watches are they I they're nice watches in in one sense, and they tend to have ETA and Salida movements in it, and Raymond Weil, the thing I sort of like about them is that they have no pretense of doing anything else. In other words, they're, they're not saying or anything else. Some of their watches are getting fairly expensive because they make some some very interesting case, uh, cases for them. All right, uh, Doxa is another one. Doxa has one of the neatest divers uh, that I think. It's, it's a wonderful one that they have. It's a big orange diver and uh, but again, it's fairly standard uh, horology. All right. <coughs> mm. 
excuse me. Um, let's take a look at some more. By, by the way, one other one I, I have, I've always liked is Bell and Ross because their watches look like uh, the instrument panels on airplanes and I used to fly. So, hey, those are cool looking watches, but they do have, they have fairly standard horology movements in it. All right, now let's take a look at uh, strong horology. Uh, the one that I have pictured there is uh, Arnold and uh, Son. I just because I like the looks of it. Uh, Arnold and Son has, uh, uh, I, I think they're English, and uh, they have a really interesting, a very interesting history. And I just, I just thought, boy, I tell you, that's a, one of the neatest moon phases. You got no doubt about that being a moon phase if you like moon phases. Uh, now, the other ones that are involved here, when we talk about strong horology, probably at the center of it is Rolex. And Rolex makes, I think, close to a million watches a year, and they make very good watches. Uh, same is true with Omega, Zenith, uh, Vulcan, uh, Tudor. Tudor just had won another, uh, I think it's their third one in the last few years, of a Grand Prix award. And uh, Harboring 2 is another one that uh, that's for this little bitty company in Austria. They've won three Grand Prix awards, which is a lot more than most big companies. Uh, Bulgari had a huge year in 2017. They won all kinds of awards. So uh, here you have a, a, a group, a collection of watches that you have some very very good quality watches, and they some of the watches they may have, some of the models they may have, may be above, sort of punching above their weight, so to speak. They may be actually good examples of high horology. One of the things that, that we're going to see, I think, in any watch company, you're going to have certain models that are either above or below their standards. I know that... Um, some watch companies that are very highly regarded have a few watches that have, <laughs> let's say, less than in-house movements in them. Uh, one of the best examples is Panerai and IWC, uh, and uh, Tag Heuer and uh, Omega, Mont Blanc, <laughs> uh, Breitling. Uh, so you have, I mean, you, it's, it's not that these these companies have no, let's say, less than uh, sterling movements. Uh, they just they just have more. We'll say more. Of the, their watches are are aimed upwards. Uh, Tudor has made the um, a few years ago when they won their first Grand Prix award. Their uh, the watch that won the award. They decided they're going to start making a uh, in-house movement, and uh, of course they're owned by Rolex, so they had a lot of good stuff there. RGM is another one. This is this wonderful American company uh, in Pennsylvania. And RGM has uh, they have some very very good in-house movements, and they also have some things that they're doing with older American movements that they find. Uh, I mean, some of the very top people, like uh, Wooten Lanen, has uh, he finds some old movement. That I think he found an old long jean that he liked because they came from this. Uh, um, oh, what are they called? This sort of a, a, a observer quality from an observatory, observatory quality, and these were the very, very highest um, calibered uh, watches. And uh, sort of like COSC on steroids. Okay, um, now let's take a look at the high horology. Now, the high horology, like I said, we think of the Holy Trinity, but there's a lot more to it than that. And again, you have some, some changes and so forth. Uh, one change I think that I thought was important was Chopard. Chopard had been... A part of strong horology. I think it it's moved up. <laughs> For once, they had the uh, grand prize winner of the uh, 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 Grand Prix de Horologie uh, in 2017, and, and they've had a lot of watches. I think that deserve of that level. Uh, some new ones to it are relatively new companies like uh, Moritz uh, Grossmann is a German company, and it's relatively new. 
Uh, so you can you will always have some kind of arguments over this, whether they're really up there or not. Uh, Gerard Perigo is another one. Uh, they won the again. They won a grand prize. They've done a lot of stuff that really show. Okay, these guys are seriously uh, part of high horology. Uh, some of the, another new one are relatively new is Jacques Droz, and um, they're they've done some very interesting things in terms of the Chinese market because the originally the Jacques Droz uh, back in the 1800s sometime they were going to China and selling watches and that was their that was their main market. And uh, they sort of revived that, uh, doing some interesting stuff there, too. Okay, um, and like I said, the Holy Trinity of uh, Patek Philippe, uh, Vacheron Constantin, and Audemars Piguet, uh, of course, they're there. Now, they have some um, that go up into the exceptional level. Uh, for example, uh, Vasseron and uh, Gerard Perigo, uh, not Gerard Perigo, but uh, Patek Philippe had the most complicated watches <laughs> in the world, <laughs> uh, mechanical watches. Uh, it was in 1989, Patek Philippe uh, surplanted um, El Lara that it had the most complicated watch since 1900. And then in 2013, uh, Vasseron Constantin uh, surpassed the uh, Patek Philippe with the most complicated. Well, these are like multi-million dollar watches they make for some extremely rich client. But that does go into exceptional horology with a cherry on top. So here you have these in this area, and, and you'll find this throughout. You'll have it not just Every watch is like this, but they're rather they're up and down. By the way, too, the one that's pictured is the uh, LUC Chopard. I think this is the one that won the grant. Uh, no, no, this is a um, chronometer for travel. I don't know if this is the one that won or not, but the point of this one is is that the whole LUC Chopard, uh, the LUC part is in a, in their movements. That's that's where they're. They really, I think, made their uh, bones as far as uh, high horology is concerned. Okay, um, now this this group, uh, the the highest one is exceptional horology. Very expensive, relatively rare. Or, I mean, relatively, yeah. They they don't make too many of them. Uh, you have people like uh, R. W. Smith, Roger Smith, who makes like ten or eleven a year. Uh, I don't know if anybody makes that few or not. Uh, well, there's like you have George Daniels. George Daniels uh, died a few years ago, and uh, there aren't going to be very many of his around. I, I'm sort of wondering if there's there ought to be a minimum number. Of watches that you have to be to produce to be considered at all because some of these are so rare it's they're very hard to find you have now on the other hand you have FP Jorn and they I think they produce about 900 watches a year now compared to a million that's like nothing <laughs> right at all and uh, some of the other watch companies are similarly have a, a small number uh, Philippe Dufour quit making them these are like you can't find those anymore. Um, uh, Louis Mornay, Laurent Ferrier, Lang and Hain is uh, one of the German uh, companies that have this. They have, again, all of these have remarkably beautiful work and uh, very low production. The one that's pictured there is a Lang and uh, uh, Hain. So it, these are simply, if you get one, they should. I mean, generally, you'll pay a lot for it. Uh, if you run across one, uh, you might be able to get a really good deal. But if when you go, when you start looking for these watches, if they're genuine and they're not faked or something else like that, um, or stolen, <laughs> they're they're generally very expensive. I I would say, 
realistically, the bottom drawer here is around $20,000, and that's probably on pre-owned. Uh, they they give you an idea. One company, uh, Christian van der Klau, they had one model called the Series that had a... Uh, uh, it wasn't. It didn't have an in-house movement. It was sort of half and half. Uh, I forgot the name of the movement that they have in there, but uh, it it was it's it was this one model they had. But that sh they also have the most incredible um, astrological anywhere. Okay. Uh, well, listen. Uh, here we talked about these these four levels. And they are always subject to argument that something is ranked too high or too low. I understand that. And I uh, would really like to hear your opinion on these. And remember, the only reason, I think, isn't so that you can stick your nose up at somebody, but rather to say, hey, um, you know, if I want to buy this, what can I, what can I expect to get? And you can expect that you should be able to, to get more if it costs more and it has certain refinements on it that others don't have. Anyway, please leave comments. Let's hear what you have to say. And uh, if you'd like to subscribe, this is an invitation. And until next week, well, actually not next week, I'll see you on Sunday. Sunday we have, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, some more real bargains that I think uh, are available in the world of uh, strong horology. Bill Sanders for Watch Art Psy, the art and science of watch collection.